Hey investor friends, I'm Michelle Markey and today I'm going to debunk some investing myths or at least some attitudes and opinions about investing that really don't follow how Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger invest. There are six key myths I'll be covering today, one of which is the myth that people think investing is like gambling and that the more volatility there is, the more risky an investment is. Number two, capital and asset allocation. There are so many myths in this category. Number three, diversify, 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 which is so wrong. Number four, the idea that you can't beat the market. Number five, the idea that you can't time the market. And number six, investing criteria that lead you to believe that there are some stocks that you can invest in based on a star rating or triple A rating in bonds. And these kinds of ratings are sometimes misleading if you don't understand what goes into them. I like to have an understanding of definitions when it comes to anything I learn. And we need to understand the definition of risk. It can mean that you're exposed to a situation that can put you in grave danger. And in the case of investing, it can mean permanent capital loss. So losing money is a risk that we take when we try to invest our capital, our money, into stocks, bonds, any kind of investment asset that we think will generate returns, but it doesn't always, it could also lead to a loss. And a lot of conventional wisdom will have you believe that in order to generate higher returns on your invested capital, that you need to be invested in riskier kinds of assets, such as stocks compared to more moderate types of investments like index funds, and compare that to what's perceived commonly as the least risky or bonds and cash. And some of these perceptions of risk stem from the institutions that back them. For example, the US government protects up to $250,000 in a US savings bank account. It's FDIC insured and with treasury bonds or treasury bills, also known as T-bills, these are considered as having almost the risk-free rate because of the United States government uh, having a dominant position in world markets. And these kinds of bonds are considered very safe. And compare that to corporate bonds, which are not necessarily always as safe because companies can go bankrupt. So they're not considered as safe as treasury bonds. I created this risk meter of myths to show how these conventional investing attitudes lead to wrong asset allocations because people tend to think that if you don't want to be too risky, then you should be in a low risk investment category, like just put your money in bonds and savings accounts or money market accounts so that you generate low returns, but then also have low risks. Or if you're feeling a little bit moderately risky, then maybe you can invest in some stocks like in index funds or real estate and have a little bit more return. Or if you want to be really aggressive and not conservative, then you would invest in just straight up stocks or equity in companies and trade in options or do commodities trades. And people will have you believe that this is the trajectory of risk and it's not the case. People think that putting money into stocks can be like gambling because you might not know where a stock is headed and maybe it will go bust like back in the dot-com bubble where there were so many companies that didn't have a great future and just went bust. So it's true, you could lose your money if you're just speculating and gambling. But what I'm going to talk about based on Warren Buffett is how to invest. And if you know and understand the company you're investing in, you're not at the kind of risk that gamblers are in when they just speculate. Many financial pundits tend to equate volatility with risk, as in, the degree of trading price variation somehow dictates that the market is either more risky or less risky to invest in. And that's not necessarily the case. So when the market is going up and down like a roller coaster and prices for a stock are either really up one day, then maybe it's a good time to buy, or really down one day, then these experts think that it's not a good time to buy. It would make you believe and make your head spin as though, um, you should follow volatility and decide on what to invest based on 
the extent of volatility in the markets, which doesn't make sense because just because any given stock is being traded a lot up or down doesn't mean that it's either a good or bad time to buy. And there's a timeless story that Warren Buffett cites from his favorite teacher and mentor, Benjamin Graham, where Mr. Market will quote you one price one day that you might think is irrational or doesn't make sense. And then there might be another day where he quotes you a price that you like, that you would want to buy a company at. And it's up to you to not pay attention to all the fluctuations of where the market can go. And as Charlie Munger likes to call it, the vicissitudes of life. Don't pay attention to where the fluctuations are in the market. Just pay attention to the price that you would want to buy a company at. And another example you could think about this as is let's say you go to a department store and you're eyeing a bag that you want to buy. And one day it's selling for retail price at $100 and another day it's selling at $80. So you think, oh, it's at a 20% discount. And then maybe another day it's back to only a 10% discount of selling at $90. And then some other time it's selling at 50% off. All these fluctuations in the price of this bag would make you think, if I can buy this bag that I really want at $50, at 50% off, that would be a win. So think about that when it comes to investing in the stock market and choosing the right price. There's a lot of questionable advice when it comes to how you should allocate your capital across assets. And some of the myths that are in this space include, depending on your risk tolerance and how long you want to invest for, what kind of uh, stock and bond split you should have, or if you want to invest in actively managed mutual funds compared with the passive index funds, which just track a popular stock index benchmark like the S&P 500. And some blog articles might say, take the age 100 that you expect to live to, subtract your current age, and that should be your stock and bond split. So if you're 20 years old, subtract that from 100. Some people think invest 80% in stocks and 20% in bonds based on that age. Or if you're 40 years old, then invest 40% in bonds and 60% in stocks. While brokerage houses offer something like target index funds, which are based on the year that you expect to retire, and they dictate certain allocations based on how many stocks they think you should have, at an earlier part of your life compared to more bonds you should probably have towards the end of your working career. So if you wanna put your trust in these somewhat arbitrary capital asset allocation models, then you may be settling for somewhat low returns where Vanguard did a study of a portfolio invested entirely in bonds from 1926 through 2018, generated about 5% of returns while a portfolio entirely in stocks over that same period of time yielded about 10% of returns. That 10% of stock market return more than likely reflects a diverse portfolio of investments. And it's not to say that diversification is always bad. Diversity in the workplace is a great thing. We want to have more equity and inclusion in the workplace. But when it comes to stocks or bonds or any other kinds of asset investments we make, we want to be a little bit more discriminating and we want to know if some of our assets are non-correlated or if they're correlated and that means that they might be subject to the same kinds of market pressures. So we want to have investments that are maybe across not only different industries but might not even be the same kind of asset class. So have uh, diversity not just in stocks, but maybe also have investments in real estate or other kinds of non-correlated assets that some people like to invest in, like gold or cryptocurrencies. And there's this retail example of a punch card that Warren Buffett likes to use. Imagine you and I go to a coffee shop and they offer a punch card where after 10 purchased coffees, we get one free. So apply this idea to the idea that you could only have 20 companies in your whole life that you can buy. And after the 20th company, you could no longer buy anymore, but you got the rewards of each of those 20 companies that you bought. And with this punch card idea, it really forces you to think about across my entire life, however much longer you have to live, 
if you could only buy 20 uh, companies, which would you choose? And how would you go about deciding what is a reasonable price for that? So it just goes to show you don't need to necessarily diversify a lot to be successful like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. If you look at Charlie Munger's portfolio as of Q2 in 2020, he only had four stocks he's invested in. And although if you look at Warren Buffett's portfolio, you might think that he's invested in a lot of stocks, but in that same quarter, if you look at anything he's invested in at 2% or more of the portfolio, there's only eight companies that take up those spots. So it might seem like he's very diversified, but in actuality, the majority of Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio is very concentrated and not in a lot of diverse stocks. And another way to think about this is with how Warren Buffett has an owner mindset. And when he owns and operates a company, he wants to be able to understand the ins and outs of running the business and what his cash flows will look like from that business. So it's a little bit more difficult to keep track of if he were to invest in 50 companies and know exactly how they all operate. And it's not to say that Berkshire Hathaway doesn't have a lot of companies, but originally in the early days of Warren Buffett investing in companies, he really wanted to understand how each of his businesses operated. And you can imagine having more than a handful can get quickly out of hand if you're not keeping track of all the finances from each of those businesses. And also liken this to how many best friendships can you have? If you have 50 best friends, I doubt that you can keep very close touch with all of them. So if you have a handful of best friends or close friends, it's a lot easier to keep up with how your friends are doing and maintain your relationships. There's the myth that you can't beat the market, which has been popularized by this concept called efficient market hypothesis, where the market is always being priced correctly with all the information that everybody in the world knows. So it would have you believe that any of the market prices you see reflect the fair value of each stock or maybe bond that you might be purchasing. And again, Buffett and Munger have shown that this is not necessarily the case especially with the Mr. Market example we talked about earlier. And Warren Buffett also gave a talk in 1984 about a coin flipping example and the probabilities that if you flip a coin enough times that you're lucky and you would succeed in the markets is not likely to have impacted the way that Warren Buffett invested. So um, Warren Buffett wasn't just lucky or by chance flipped enough coins so that he was able to generate the kinds of returns he did. He was able to beat the market by understanding companies that he invested in. In the fifth myth, some pundits say, don't try to time the market and things like you're better off dollar cost averaging into an investment than trying to pick the bottom for a stocks. Unlike what the adage says of buy low and sell high. And it's a little bit more nuanced than just that common adage. While it's true, it would be great to buy low if there's a company that's on sale, just like the handbag example we talked about earlier, if it's 50% off and you know that it retails for $100, you definitely want to buy a company that you think is on sale. And it may be at a bottom price, but if you know that this company is going to be a great company in the future and you have an understanding of how it performs, you can feel better assured at buying a great company at what's called a margin of safety price or some amount, say 50% or some other percentage that you think is a discount to its fair value and it would be a great investment going long term into the future. And Warren Buffett likes to say, be fearful when others are greedy. So if the markets are at the top, be scared that they're very overpriced at that time and be greedy when others are fearful. So that would kind of make you think, let's buy companies when they're at rock bottom prices. And last, I'd like to cover the myth of trusting ratings that you don't understand the methodology behind. So you could see stars and stripe bands attributed to funds, or you could see bonds being rated prime or investment grade or not investment grade with 
things like AAA, BBB, B minus, or when it comes to trying to measure socially responsible companies with something called environmental social governance, or also known as ESG. So another rating agency might also give them AAA ratings and say they're leaders or average or they're laggards. And if you think about if companies are being socially responsible, they do offer some criteria that are definitely worth considering. Like if a business is treating its workers right, they're trying to be environmentally sustainable. And the premise behind some of the intentions with uh, ESG is that you want to have businesses that can generate high returns while still being sustainable for the world. And that's not a bad goal to have, but how you rate the companies and then decide to invest in them is somewhat dubious based on just going with some of these ratings alone. So just like there's no shortcut to diet and exercise, there's also no shortcut to how you invest and which criteria you use. So there's no magical diet pill or rating that can easily say buy this company and sell it at this time. And it requires you put in the work. So with Charlie Munger's no nonsense approach, this kind of investing criteria can lead you to have better results than just relying on a bunch of stars or prime rating, whatever those things might mean. And if you want to buy companies, you should consider factors of are you capable of understanding this company? Does this company have a moat or a competitive durable advantage? And is the management team uh, talented? Do they have integrity and they're not stupid? And last, you wanna buy a wonderful company at a fair price, not buy a fair business at a wonderful price. And definitely buy with a margin of safety, like I mentioned earlier. Those were the six myths I want to cover. So you could take a conventional path, more than likely leading to mediocre results, or a road less taken like Buffett and Munger leading to superior investment results. And a funny anecdote to leave you with is during one Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, Charlie Munger said that diversification is for the know-nothing investor. Well, Warren Buffett tried to walk that back a little bit and say, sometimes the know-nothing investor can actually beat the professional. So it just goes to show you sometimes, even if you want to take a passive, common approach to investing, you could do that and still do well. But if you want to be a little bit more in control of your financial fate, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have laid a pretty good blueprint for us to follow. If you enjoyed this video or learned something, please like and subscribe. And if you have questions, please leave them in the comments below. Till next time.